Welcome to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, editor-at-large at The Hub. I'm honored to be back in conversation with David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly video and podcast series on the key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. We're speaking about a week after a Wall Street Journal editorial about Canadian defense spending sent shockwaves through Ottawa. The editorial made the case that Canada is a free rider when it comes to defense and security issues, and even that we ought to be reconsidered as a G7 member as a result. Whatever one thinks about the argument and its implications, it's worth asking ourselves, how has Canada come to so underinvest in defense and security, and what are the consequences? I'm grateful to speak with David about that fundamental question. David, thanks for joining us as always. Well, thank you. We should start, since we started with the Wall Street Journal editorial, by talking about your letter uh, that was published in, in response to that. Why don't you tell everybody what you said and, um, and the thought process that led you to say it? Well, that's kind of you to say, David. Um, as you mentioned, in, in response to the editorial, which we can talk a bit about, I was asked to submit a letter to the editor that try to provide some color around the explanation for Canada's um, underinvestment in defense and security. And the issue that I attribute it to principally um, is the fact, and in part, something that you and I have, have talked about on, on this show at, at different points, is that the national government in Canada, and this isn't simply a partisan issue, it's one that extends over a series of federal governments, uh, seem more interested in uh, provincial and local issues and, and less focused on uh, what Section 91 of the Constitution establishes as the exclusive jurisdictions of the national government, including, of course, uh, defense and security. As I put it at different times, David, we're living in a Section 91 world, uh, but we have a national government that's principally interested in Section 92 of the Constitution, which, of course, is uh, the provincial responsibilities. And, and that needs to change, including, um, but not limited to, uh, increasing defense spending. Um, but let's let's get into the editorial because uh, you know as as I as I mentioned in the introduction, it really has seemingly touched a nerve. It's not necessarily yeah. a, a, a new argument or development, um, but it, it follows a series of of slights on defense and security issues, including Canada's exclusion from the AUKUS defense and security pact between Australia, the U.S. and, and U.K. What do you make of the overall argument uh, before we get into uh, the explanations for it and what what ought to be done about it is Canada under is Canada's underinvestment rather in defense and security issues contributing to our isolation uh, on these matters? For sure, um, if you uh, if you don't um, pay for the admission to the church supper, uh, you don't get the potluck. Um, the at mention of Australia is very relevant to understand what's going on here because this is a profound inherent characteristic of Canadian politics. The best book I've ever read about Canadian security doctrine is about, actually a book about Australia. Hmm. Um, and it's written by an historian named Jeffrey Blaney, and it's called The Tyranny of Distance. And a, a point that Blaney makes is Australia has always been, obviously, very far away from the imperial metropole of the moment, whether London or Washington. As a result, the defense of Australia has always been a very low priority or very low possibility even for the imperial metropole. It's hard to do, it's far away, they have other concerns. And so Australia has been forced both to act in its own defense, but also to prove itself as worthy of defense by contributing. That's why there were Australians in Vietnam and during the Vietnam War, not because Australians agreed that Vietnam was so important. Vietnam is quite far away from Australia, but they were proving themselves to the Americans as a, as a good ally who, if Australia ever needed help, had earned the right to be helped. Canada is in the opposite position. The American, the Imperial Metropole, first London, but especially Washington, has absolutely no choice about defending Canada. Um, and you might even say more cynically, if you're a Canadian Prime Minister or Defense Minister, look, Canada has two kinds of security problems. One comes from the United States, nothing to be done about that. And one comes from everywhere else in the world, and then it's the Americans' problem. Um, and so it's rational to underinvest in defense. The price of the underinvestment, however, is that your views don't get heard. Now, Canadians have tried to offset this by saying, even though Canadian governments underinvest in defense, maybe they can make up for it by other kinds of security cooperation, peacekeeping, um, international assistance, maybe that can get Canada the seat at the table Canada wants. But of course, um, in recent decades, under both the Trudeau government and the Harper government before that, Canada has underinvested in those aspects, those soft power aspects of security too. And so Canadian voices just, just don't get hurt. So it's a rational decision, but it has predictable consequences. 
Yeah, well, why don't you uh, take up that point a bit further, David? Um, how does that translate into everyday consequences for Canadians? Uh, make the case that being a, a free rider is more harmful than, say, a smart arbitrage. Yeah, well, well, we're about to have a very dramatic example of this in um, uh, the, when it comes time to redevelop Ukraine. Uh, the, will Canada invest in proportion to its stated views on the Ukraine question? And this is it's going to be expensive. And, and my guess is Canada probably won't. Um, and won't invest correspondingly. They'll, there'll be some sp splashy, high-profile projects um, chosen with a view to internal ethnic politics in Canada, which is how these decisions are usually made. But there won't be a serious commitment to reconstruction. And the result of that is um, when the reconstruction of Ukraine means redoing a lot of the economic architecture of the whole European continent, of the whole transatlantic area, and Canada just is not going to be hurt. Um, and that there have been, uh, Canada is shut out from, the, uh, as the world moves, as the developed world moves in more protectionist tendencies, uh, Canada just is not a voice. So, you know, uh, when, when the Trump administration um, started to push Mexico uh, uh, um, in protectionist directions over the so-called USMCA, the USMACA agreement, um, Mexican, Mexican opinions did get some consideration, Canadian opinions very, little. Canada was able to defend some of its things, but it wasn't able to advance anything because it, it didn't get hurt. Um, Canada has been absent from the question that should be important to Canadians. How do you deal with the economic isolation of the post-Brexit UK? Why, why isn't Canada influential inside NAFTA in saying, well, um, look, whatever one thinks of the decision to exit Brexit, well, maybe Britain could be, readmit, could be admitted to NAFTA as a NAFTA partner, if that's the choice they've made. And they're such a close friend of Canada's. No voice. Um, and Post uh, and one of the things that one would think you'd ask for during the course of saying, okay, we're going Canada is going to pay its fair share of the trillion dollar cost of rebuilding Ukraine. That means Canada says no more protectionism against NAFTA goods by the EU countries who are going to be the biggest winners from the reconstruction of Ukraine. You don't know, write the check, you don't get hurt. Um, let's talk a bit about what you think is behind the problem here. Uh, what do you think explains uh, this underinvestment in basic defense and security? Why have Canadian policymakers and voters effectively chosen butter over guns? Well, so it starts with this rational decision to free ride on the United States and accept American protection. Uh, what then happens is the people who are trapped, the people who are interested in questions of national security don't go into national politics. And often they end up you know, going to international organizations or leaving Canada, making careers at British or American think tanks, um, and then being involved in other countries' policy debates because Canada just isn't an actor. Uh, the people politics then recruits for um, people who are interested in, as you say, these uh, local issues, economic issues, welfare issues. And so you have a political class that is biased in, in this way. I mean, one of the things that I've suggested on this podcast before that might be a counteractive is um, designate a range of security officials, heads of CSIS, heads of the RCMP, certain kinds of military officials, and it doesn't matter which, but just pick a range of them where there is an automatic track from retiring from that job to a seat in the Senate. Um, that try to build, and this is one of the things the Australians do, that they favor military people in their Senate. They favor military people for their governor general. Canada does the opposite. But if you had a block of a dozen people in the Senate with military or security experience, you would have at least some voice inside Parliament to guarantee that those issues got discussed, which now doesn't happen, because it certainly doesn't happen in the House of Commons. Yeah, just in parentheses, I think that's a really insightful proposal to effectively create a Canadian version of the Vulcans um, in Washington, who, of course, are such strong protectors of, of the exercise of national power. Um, what would you say, David, to the argument that one of the obstacles, which perhaps isn't unique to Canada, um, is the dysfunction within the Department of National Defense itself? Uh, the country's challenges with military procurement are well documented. And I think there's a tendency to see military investments principally as a regional development policy, as opposed to a defense and national security one. How, how do we resolve that impediment uh, to greater investment and a more effective uh, defense capacity? I think that's a symptom, not a cause. Um, so let me put it this way. If, if you are someone who feels strongly that Canada should buy the most advanced technology at the best price, regardless of where it's produced, you're not going to have a career 
in Canadian defense procurement. <laughs> um, people are going to treat you like a crazy, like a crazy person and a menace to society because everyone knows that the purpose of defense procurement is to win seats in Atlanta, Canada. That's <laughs> what it's for, uh, and that's why that's why you do it. And indeed, if it weren't for the need to win seats in Atlanta, Canada, there probably wouldn't be any defense procurement at all. Um, or I mean, there are two purposes: seats in Atlanta, Canada and keeping the Americans quiet on other trade issues by buying some of their airplanes, especially if you, if you can get obsolete ones that don't work very well, that's perfect. But you, whatever is the minimum airplane price the Americans demand to continue to have some Canadian participation in, in the North American defense industries. That's just how Canadians think about it. If you got serious, um, if, for example, there were more money at stake, um, and if people cared about the results of what the military equipment did, no one would tolerate this dysfunction in, in national defense. It is tolerated because it's not a defect. It's, it's the way the system works. The whole point of it is patronage and pork barrel, not national defense. And everyone understands that. And those who don't understand it, quit. Or those who don't like it, quit. I, I mentioned the, the role of, of federalism as a, as a possible impediment, David. Uh, we've had now, as you mentioned, successive governments dedicate scarce federal dollars to provincial issues, including childcare, healthcare, and so on. Uh, in a world of public finance scarcity, uh, how do we make the case to not just federal policymakers, but ultimately Canadians, um, that the federal government needs to uh, direct more of its spending uh, to defense and national security and away from uh, um, some of these other uh, social policy areas? Well, what does scarcity here mean? Um, it's not that can there is Canada doesn't tax a lot. It's not like the federal government doesn't spend a lot. Um, it's not like um, uh, that Canada is a poorer country than it was in 1958 when it had a meaningful defense commitment. Yeah. Um, it, there's resource abundance. There's resource abundance. There's just a lot of claims. Um, we discussed last time, Canada now spends more every year dealing with various kinds of direct payments to Native organizations and Native persons than it spends on national defense. And that's an astonishing, an astonishing level of expenditure. And that's not counting, by the way, the indirect payments that all Native persons are entitled to in, in, in the course of generally available programs. So there's resource, there's plenty of resources uh, for those things. Uh, it's a matter of choice and what you take seriously and what you care about. And, um, and the question that Canadians need to think about with this is, um, it really is true, like, no foreign invader is ever going to set foot on any meter of Canadian territory. The Americans will not allow it. But the question is, as with that Chinese balloon story, um, when a Canadian plane shot down a Chinese balloon, but using American information and American tracking, is do you want your defense partners to show you respect? And in that case, the respect was a little theatrical, but do you want real respect? Do you want really to be consulted? Do you want your voice to be heard? Um, and when it comes time to build a new kind of world, and I think we're going to be in such a place after the conflict ends in Ukraine and reconstruction begins or the conflict subsides in Ukraine and reconstruction begins. It's going to be a very important moment of, of creation, like as big as 1990, maybe even bigger than that. Do Canadians want to be there? Do they want to be heard? Well, then they have to be part, they have to, they have to bear the difficulty as well as well in order to have a share of the voice. It's a sort of axiom, David, that defense and foreign policy issues uh, don't tend to loom large in uh, federal election campaigns. Uh, but one wonders, in light of uh, recent uh, revelations about Chinese interference in our national elections, if the next election may be different, um, that concerns about Canadian national security and the integrity of our democracy may resonate more with Canadian voters. It, at the risk of asking a speculative question, do, do you see a, a scenario where defense and foreign policy issues uh, might just matter more these days? I don't know, um, but what I would hope that would be part of the educative process of politics is to make people understand that foreign policy and security policy are no longer, if they ever were, just about tanks and airplanes. Um, modern security challenges are much more a spectrum. Um, and one of the things about that is true about the modern world, and this is perhaps why the Ukraine war is so shocking because it breaks with this trend, is we have seen a even authoritarian regimes recognition of the limits of violence as a tool of state power. Yes. Um, and the, the Russians did much better with 
their um, their trolling operations in 2016 to help Donald Trump win the presidency than they did with their full scale invasion of Ukraine. And one of the lessons that you compare return on investment for what they did in 2016 with return on investment for what they did in 22, you say it's stupid to send tanks. Um, you know, use propaganda, use manipulation, use these these kinds of techniques. And one of the things that um, makes the Chinese a much more effective and um, uh, sinister without being dangerous competitor is they seem to understand this. And I, I mean, I think they've got us all looking in the wrong direction about, about imagining an invasion of Taiwan uh, when you can corrupt Taiwanese politicians, when you can wage information warfare, when you can use propaganda. These are the methods of 21st century politics that, that really work in state to state competition. And so the Canadians, you know, I think maybe one of the ways you persuade them is making them understand, look, it's not just about hardware. I mean, you need the hardware, absolutely. And the hardware is useful in all kinds of ways you can't begin to imagine. But hardware is the beginning of your national security strategy. It is not the sum and substance of it, um, because all these other kinds of challenges are important too, cyber. And, uh, and, and by the way, we now need to think of environmental and pandemic issues as part of national security too. And that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a full spectrum. And I think, I think we all understand this. We just, at any given moment, people would rather say, I'd rather, I'd rather buy something else. Yeah, that, that's a, a ton of insight, David. I, and I think important for um, policymakers and politicians to, to hear um, that as much as the focus has been in recent days on whether Canada ought to uh, aspire to the 2% of GDP NATO target, as you say, we need to be looking systematically uh, across our defense and, and national security architecture to make sure that Canada is as capable of responding to these new and emerging challenges and threats. And I think the experience of the past several months with respect to the Chinese election interference story is that we weren't, I mean, at minimum, uh, we didn't have the right mechanism to make sure that that intelligence was getting to the right people in the government. And more fundamentally, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a sign that we need to um, strengthen our resiliency around uh, this type of, as you say, um, different forms of of national security uh, right. threats than we've experienced to, in the past. I want to say something harsher about that, because I think what happened both with COVID and with the Chinese election interference, the Trudeau government was incapable of seeing a national security threat as anything other than an ethnic politicking opportunity within Canada, or ethnic politicking opportunity and dangers. So confronted with evidence of the recklessness of the Chinese state in handling COVID, whatever the exact origin of the pandemic, pretty clearly they kept out foreign observ observers, they lied, they manipulated, they, they bought up supplies on world markets, uh, knowing that they had a serious problem while lying to other people. Um, and the, the Trudeau government just thought, my God, if we do anything about any of this, we might risk some votes in Chinese speaking communities. And so, and that was the only thing they could focus on. The same thing with the Chinese election interference. They're just incapable of taking the problem seriously. And I, I don't know that they were, I mean, there's some accusations they were compromised and maybe that's a little bit of it. I think they were just childish. It just, the only thing that was real to them was student council politics. And the uh, global dangers were unreal to them. And, and this is part of the, when you say, why, how do you get people interested? Um, um, you get them interested in maybe those two examples, and especially the COVID one show, how dangerous it is to have a government that doesn't take the securing of the nation profound, doesn't internalize that as the first thing to talk about on the agenda at the cabinet table. And then the question of well, ha what happens to our votes in certain areas in Toronto and Vancouver, that should be the last thought, if it's thought about at all, which it probably shouldn't be thought about at all. Yeah, well, well said. I just say in parentheses that uh, former Canadian ambassador to China, David Mulroney, who we've had on the Hub podcast at, at different points, it makes the case that we need to shed this tendency to think about defense and foreign policy issues through the lens of diaspora politics and instead through the lens of fundamental national interests. And as you say, I think particularly this government, but 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 successive governments have um, for, too, for too long um, chosen the former uh, rather than the latter. Uh, let's wrap up, David, um, coming back to uh, the recent NATO meetings, which sort of situate uh, this conversation we're having. I note that the leaders communicate redefine the 2% target from an aspirational goal to more of a floor in light of the evolving global defense and, and security environment. 
I want to ask you about the state of the world. Um, do you think it's becoming more dangerous? And if so, what does that mean for a country like Canada? Um, I, I think if, if, look, in some ways it's becoming a lot less dangerous. Um, people who are who die as a result of state to state violence, um, when that is charted, it's just a plunge. And compared to the middle years of the 20th century, we live in a very peaceful world. Sure. And as I said, that, that um, uh, one of the things that the Ukraine war is also demonstrating is as terrifying as nuclear weapons are, just how useless they are. Um, that, mm -hmm. that early, you know, that the Russians are a nuclear power, what good does that do them in any practical terms? And so nu nuclear weapons are for terrorism, they're not for state to state competition. And that's a, a relief. But what we are discovering is the world in which problems are interlocking in, in new and more sophisticated ways. And um, the Russians have used environmental terrorism as a world of war, as a weapon of war, by blowing up dams and by threatening nuclear power plants. Um, now, uh, pandemics are part of a, um, a problem of national security um, because although the pandemic may or may not be a natural phenomenon, the Chinese monopolization uh, using uh, um, information advantage to monopolize medical equipment in the early months of that, that was a national security challenge. So um, I, I, we have a lot of things going for us. It's a better world in so many ways. Uh, that means the opportunities from good choices are bigger than they ever used to be. And, and that's something else we ought to be thinking about is that um, how do we, you know, among the, the security challenges we have are how, how do we deal with problems of international organized crime networks? Um, that are so threatening to this continent because uh, you know the, the the issue we worry about in in Mexico is not that some foreign invader is going to invade not that we should worry about domestically I should say it's not that some foreign invader is going to attack Mexico but the Mexican state may stop functioning because it can't compete with organized crime networks they need security assistance from their friends but that also takes the form of showing them how to set up proper courts that are not frightened. Um, Legal, uh, independent legal institutions are going to be crucial to the security of Ukraine uh, when the war ends. So it's, it's just a much more complex, interlocked problem. But thank God we do live in a more peaceful world than our parents and grandparents do. And we owe the military sacrifices of the past some gratitude for what they have achieved for us in the present. Here, here. What a great message uh, to wrap up today's conversation. It was fascinating as always. Uh, David Frum, thank you so much for joining me. I, I look forward to catching up in a couple of weeks.